to the cloud. And um, I'm going to keep Diane on here just right now until we actually need someone for his interpretation. So if we do, we will stop and we'll we'll re we'll uh, redo that. But um, mm -hmm. we want to start off with introductions. My name is Leah Dardis, and I'm the Director of Special Education here in Oceanside Unified School District. Previously, I worked here as a principal at Garrison Elementary, and I've taught first grade, fifth, and fourth. So welcome here. Um, Lynn, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Let me mute myself first. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Lynn Duras and I am a special education teacher on special assignment. And um, I taught both general education, um, several elementary grades, and then also um, special education mod severe classroom. And um, I'm a board certified behavior analyst. So um, I support with behaviors across the district. And then um, I also like to support the mod severe programs. Um, and go visit all the, the kiddos. So thank you for being here. So today our conversation is really about procedural safeguards. And that to me is the most important part of anything that we do um, in our job. While for us, we may have 20 IEPs in a year or as a school principal, I had 160. This is the only IEP for your child. And so we really need to make sure that we have families that understand their parental rights. So today's topic is really about parental rights. Um, I'm going to actually stop sharing for one second because we just had a family join us. Good morning. Señora, usted necesita alguien en español o lo puede hacer en inglés? En español. Ok. Le voy a enseñar las instrucciones para hacerlo. Ok. okay. okay. All right. So um, let me share my screen again. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how we are going to do the. I mean, sign the interpreter. Diane, thumbs up. Did it activate you? No, oh, not yet. Okay, let me try it again. Not letting me stop that. Let me try this again. There we go. Okay, start. Yes. Okay. Ahora, okay. So this is the instructions for how to complete our um, interpretation for Zoom. So I'm gonna just show it to you in English because obviously if you're here in English, you don't need it, but para las personas para el español, consejos para Zoom. Oprima el botón para la interpretación y selecciona español. ¿Sí se lo encuentras, familia Ávila? Casi, um, o te dejé me contar. Está aquí en el panel. Eh, ¿Dónde dice configuración de la reunión? No, dice um, interpretación. Tiene un globo como el mundo. Es un botón en, en el panel de, de abajo o puede estar aquí arriba. También dice okay. la... Okay. Uh, ya, yeah. le pongo español. Sí. Ok, ya está. Ok, y luego sí puede aprimir y apaga y encender el micrófono cuando está, estoy hablando. Ok. Ok, sí, sí. So we are going to start, sí. um, okay, I'm going to start a video that we are going to call, it's called Welcome to Holland, um, and then um, at a later time, our, our other family, we have a version of it in Spanish, 
So Lynn, if you would please from the agenda, drop the links into the chat so that our participants can have either the English version or the Spanish version to watch at a later time um, if we're not able to make our video work. So Lynn, thumbs up, it works. Can you hear it? No? What? Stop share. Share screen. Advanced sharing options. Oops, it's not giving me. Yeah, share Sam. You were right. I love this video. It's it's just such a nice way to think about our roles. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and you make your wonderful plans. The Colosseum, the Michelangelo David, the gondolas in Venice. You may learn some handy phrases in Italian. Thumbs up that you can it's hear all it. It's very exciting. Okay, thank you. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands. The stewardess comes in and says, Welcome to Holland. Holland, you say? What do you mean, Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life, I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland, and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks, and you must learn a whole new language, and you will meet a whole new group of people you would have never met. It's just a different place. It's slower paced than Italy, less flashy than Italy, but after you've been there for a while and you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills and Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they had there. And for the rest of your life, you'll say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. And that pain will never, ever, ever go away. Because the loss of that dream is a very, very significant loss. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. I love that video. That was shared with me by one of our parents, Veronica Garcia, that has been working with us to help us with our parent guardian panels to really um, beef it up and, and make it appropriate. Um, and the Spanish version is talking about not going to Holland or to Italy, but about traveling between the beach and the mountains and the, um, the differences in that. Are there any thoughts that you would like to share out about this video? Well, feel free to, to put something in the in the chat. I you know the it's just I think a nice way to to think about our our trip here. Uh, there we go. So our outcomes for today is that we would really love to work with our parents and guardians to have a better understanding of the rights under procedural safeguards, and we really want to, all of our participants to understand how to resolve concerns or disagreements about your student special education services, because it's it's so critical. Like I said to you before, you know this may be 160 of my IEPs, but this is only one of yours, and that can sometimes seem from the from the teacher's point of view very different than from the parents, and so. 
really understanding what rights you have under the procedural safeguards is critical for you to really be a successful advocate for your child. And one of the things that I really loved about this particular um, um, flyer is that our North Coastal Consortium for Special Education, which we call NICSI, and you'll sometimes hear our teachers call that, have a lot of opportunities and resources for parents that we don't often um, celebrate. So for example, next week on Wednesday, I'm gonna be sending out a flyer for our community advisory committee who's going to have a speaker come on November 10th to talk about um, disabilities and then post IEPs. So we have students that have IEPs that are, you know, all the way from just needing really small articulation issues that, you know, all the way to students who are very, very impacted by their needs. And so really having a place for everyone to have the same rights and understand that is critical. And so that's what I love about NICSI and especially about our community advisory committee. So today at a glance, we're gonna talk about our procedural safeguards notice, what it means to have parent participation, access to educational records, what is confidentiality, uh, confidentiality of information, informed consent or parental consent, prior written notice, something about understandable language. And I love this one because Diane, when I sent her our PowerPoint to translate, she came back and really was um, noticing and said, you know, really make sure when we talk about understandable language that the right to interpretation and translation services are part of your rights and a critical part of your rights. The rights you have for doing independent educational evaluations, stay put, and really the, the most important part is how do we resolve concerns when I'm not agreeing with the team, but I don't necessarily want to file anything legal, but I want to have a way that we have somebody that can help us come to a compromise about what's going on with our, my child's education. Anytime that you have a, a question, a concern, um, anything that you, know, you want us to answer, please just drop it in the chat. Lynn is watching our chat. You can write it in Spanish and I can read it. So don't worry about language being an issue. And we would be happy to, to share anything. If we um, don't cover something that you do have a question about, feel free to ask us. And if we can't answer, we will get back to you. So Lynn, are you starting off or am I? Okay, so first we're going to talk about the um, procedural safeguards and first, let me close this chat and see if that helps. There's a black bar on mine. Is there one on yours on your screen? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to try to guess what's behind the um, black bar because it's in the middle of my, oh. I'll go ahead then. I, it's weird. <laughs> Look. It is weird on her screen. I, I verified. <laughs> Let me mute Lynn. We're in the same office right now to make it easier for us to present. Uh, procedural safeguards don't spell out the services or accommodations that a student would need in an IEP. So this isn't about the actual things in the IEP. This really describes those ground rules for helping develop collaborative relationships between parent and guardians and the school district. And so when we say that, it's really about parents and guardians and let's say, your case manager, your general education teacher, everyone who's on your IUP team, anyone here who works at the district office, we are all part of those different layers. And these are those ground rules for talking about it. And so um, that is why every time we have a meeting where we're looking at it, we are always talking about, here's your procedural safeguards. If you have questions, if you don't understand something, that is really the time you can ask, or you can ask at any time, but really understanding those are critical. And sometimes it seems like you could wallpaper your house after having done it for 20 years with having students with IEPs because they're about 20 pages long. And, and you say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm ruining trees. You're not, we really want you to know what your parental rights are. And so they're very important and that you have your legal rights and protections and that we are doing this for our students. And so our procedural safeguards really talk about these written explanation of your rights, both under IDEA and, and our state's laws. What's interesting is that um, in California, our special education laws are significantly more um, 
restraining than in other states. And so our procedural safeguards really represent how California has implemented both IDEA and Ed Code into the procedural safeguards. So here in California, we, you as a parent really have a lot of rights and, um, and guarantees in order to really help make sure that your, um, the rights of your child is being um, um, satisfied during the IEP. So one of those rights is your parent participation. So the legal right to participate in a meeting about your child's education, including IEP meetings. And you can call an IEP meeting at any time throughout the school year. So of course, when you make a written request, we have up to 30 days to honor your request. This sometimes gets a little tricky when we are having so many IEPs to schedule and, and um, all of those things. And especially at the beginning of your year where we're having people transfer into our school, those can sometimes be congested times. Um, most of the time, our case managers really want to work with you and try to find days and times that are going to be um, accessible. But they also have to work with a lot of related service providers. So for example, if your child gets occupational therapy, your child may be one, in, at, like let's say your school is Fusat, that's one of eight schools that that occupational therapist covers. And within each one of those schools might have a caseload of like five to 10. So trying to you know, arrange all of that for case managers can be very, very tricky for them. You, we also have the access to educational records. So you get the right to see, huh? Oh, you have the right to see and get an explanation of your child's school records. We have five business days to make these records available to you. And these rights are protected by IDEA and our FERPA. So let's say you had a question about your IEP records and you talked to the school and they were like, well, we don't have your IEP records. That is true. We house all of our IEP records from previous years to present of anything that's happened. And Susie Baruman is our records uh, queen. I, I say that jokingly, but also very seriously because um, she trains a lot of our teachers um, about the, uh, the way that she would like her IEPs um, sent into her so that she can make sure that we can then pass it back to parents or anyone else who asks for um, records. If you want her email and her name, I put it into the chat. Um, I know her name, it sounds very Dutch. Her first husband was Dutch, but she does speak Spanish. She's from Argentina. So don't worry that language is an issue with our department. We have many people here who speak Spanish and want to help you with that. We also guarantee that your child's information is confidential. That includes personal information such as your child's name, address. Of course, we don't ask for social security number, so that wouldn't be on there, but other personal details. And that sounds a little funny because you're like, well, who would have access to my child's records? And so, for example, at your school, and I'm going to take a student um, again at Fusat, who is a student that is in fourth grade, because of course I love teaching fourth grade, and he receives some pullout services for reading and he receives some speech. And so the teacher who does the pullout services for academics, um, in this case might be Mackenzie, you know, see at Busat, it is Mackenzie Messer. And so and Mackenzie is gonna say, I'm gonna share the IEP at a glance with the general education teacher and her paraprofessional so that your child's general education teacher and the paraprofessional that pushes into the classroom can see what goals and what services your child might need. That still maintains confidentiality because these are the workers who specifically support your child within the classroom. That doesn't mean that I'm gonna give the IEP at a glance to let's say um, our front desk person, but I might share it with the assistant principal, a uh, school counselor. It really depends on all of the services and accommodations but our school staff is all trained even our school front office staff to know that this is confidential information and um, even if it was um, shown to them that they are bound by um, working for the district and it's all confidential but we do share the ieps at a glance so that everyone who works with the child can support them and understand what goals services and accommodations um, would be are there any questions um, comments or concerns so far 
and be, feel free to just drop them in the chat if you have anything. So all of this sounds pretty information, you know, yeah, pretty basic. We know that we all this is done. So this is the part though that makes um, special education much different than let's say if you have a student who's an English language learner is that you have to give parental consent before we evaluate your child or we implement any of the special education services. So that means that every time that we do an initial evaluation or every th three years we do a triennial where we reevaluate their um, um, eligibility or any time that you say, you know, I'm, I've been noticing that they're really struggling with, let's say, some anxiety about returning back to school because we've been off for almost this is our third year and I really want them to be assessed and looked at some maybe some additional counseling services we can all of those things you should get some kind of form an assessment plan that says you give permission for your child to be evaluated and then every time we have our IEP meeting you're not just signing that you were attending well you do sign that you attended but it's that you agree to implement their special education services and so what happens when you don't agree this is the part that we don't often um, get to that's what we're going to talk about at the very end with our alternative dispute resolution and so we just want to make sure that that you really hold a lot of the power in this particular part but that doesn't also mean that we don't have alternative ways so let's say that um, were, you know, not that anyone on this call, but says, you know, I'm just not agreeing with implementing her special education services. We have program coordinators that will support the case managers to really make sure that we're having a good opportunity for, for schools to collaborate with parents, because that's really the critical part of this. Lynn, are you ready? Okay, uh, let me unmute this too. Okay. So for the um, prior written notice, so um, the prior written notice is a legal right guaranteed to parents um, of kids with IEP. So the prior written notice requires the school to send written explanations um, of the, of the pro proposed changes. So sometimes the prior written notice is called a PWN. Um, so if you hear those letters, that's what that means. Um, and it's essentially a letter that is um, explaining any changes that are going to be occurring in the child's educational plan, or also if um, you are requesting something and, and the district is um, denying that parent request, you will receive um, a prior written notice, which is going to let me see a letter that is um, explaining why the district is denying that parent request. So what makes this interesting? So what makes this one interesting is that in California, our prior written notices are much different than in other states. Remember when I talked to you first about how education, California's education code is a lot more restrictive than other states. This is one of those ways that it is because the prior written notice and how it is implemented in other states is very is different than how we do it here in California. So in a prior written notice, what would have happened is that we would have sent a prior written notice anytime that we made any kind of changes or any amendments to your plan and say, hey, that we're not, we're not going to approve or we're gonna deny your request. In California, we actually have to hold IEP meetings where we discuss that before we can send prior written notice denying a parent's request. So that's a slight difference that you would see in between California and other states is that the way that prior written notices are um, implemented here are not similar to procedural safeguards that you would have in other states, which is where this becomes a much more narrow restrictive um, interpretation for, um, for prior written notices. Okay, are you gonna move it to the next? Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, the prior written notice um, needs to include um, the following. So it needs to include an explanation of why the school wants to make a change or is refusing to make the change. Um, it also needs um, to include a description of other options that were considered 
and why those options were rejected. Um, in addition, it needs to include a description of each test or record that the school used to make the decision. So basically the data, you know, what data was used in order to make the decision. Um, it also needs to include a reminder that parents do have legal rights um, to procedural safeguards and information about how parents can get a written copy of their legal rights. And also um, it should include contact information um, for parents to, to get information and to help understanding their rights. So Lynn, what might be a PWN that you have seen being written? Um, so you want me to give a specific example of, okay. So um, we've had an example of um, uh, a parent in an IEP meeting requesting um, music therapy and um, the team, uh, they wanted a, a music therapy assessment and music therapy um, services. And um, the team, while, you know, we use music in the classroom, we didn't feel that um, the, t the team and the service providers didn't feel that music therapy needed to be um, assessed and it's not really an area of assessment and it's not a service that we provide like in our IEPs, we don't provide music therapy services. And so um, we let the parent know that we would get back to them that at this time, you know, we don't agree to that, but that we will get back to them. And then a letter needed to be sent out a PWN or um, prior written notice needed to be sent out to the family explaining um, why um, this request was being rejected and how the student was already making progress in their goals, um, given the current services that the student was receiving and, um, and that they would be, their needs would be met with the services that we were offering. Um, so that's an example of, of a time that we sent a PWN. Okay, so um, when the school sends a prior written notice. So um, I gave you one example, but it's any time the school proposes to start or change um, nearly anything related to your child's education. Um, so for example, the school wants to change the child's IEP, it needs to send a prior written notice. Um, as Leah Dardis was explaining, we um, typically would have an IEP meeting, but sometimes we need to follow up with a prior written notice or something changes. Um, I think we sent a prior written notice with COVID, uh, didn't we? I don't know. <laughs> it seems like so long ago. Um, well, anytime something changes like unexpectedly, I guess, but, um, but we would typically meet in an IEP meeting. Um, the school must also give written notice if it rejects any parent requests, like I was giving you that example of the parent that wanted the music therapy, um, and we sent a prior written notice to explain why that was being, um, that request was being rejected. Um, and it may also be when the school wants to conduct an initial evaluation. So um, let's say, I guess that wouldn't be the case for, for any of you if your students are already in special education, but if the school is finding that um, a student is really, well, it could be, I guess, in a different area. If the school um, staff is finding that a student is um, really struggling in a certain area and we wanna assess that area and the parents are disagreeing, they don't want that area assessed, we could, um, send a PWN to the family saying we really need to assess in this particular area because it's an area of concern. Um, and then also when the school says no to a request for an evaluation, um, services or placement. So um, if you were requesting a certain placement that um, the team didn't feel like was, was necessary or appropriate for your child, then we would um, be sending a prior written notice to explain why we reject that um, request. So in any time that we have an IEP, one of the things that I'm guilty of as a teacher, as a principal, as, a, as an educator, 
is not always using understandable language. And what that means is that like most other educators who are my friends, we use a lot of acronyms that are not always clear um, to other people that are not in our field. Um, I know that uh, when I was first starting off in my career and I would come home and be super excited and I was telling my, um, my dad all about, you know, what I was learning. And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And this is one, you know, somebody who's educated and distinguished in his career. So it, it's really about what do you do when you don't understand all of the information that we're talking about? Because I will look at some of those psychologist reports and I'm not a school psychologist. And there's a lot of language in there that sometimes isn't understandable. And so, you know, it's hard because you don't want to appear as not being educated. But I think a lot of times we really need to talk about some of those words are really hard. I know one of the first words that I thought was really challenging to was psychos. No, so the one where you always think that you're hurt. No, it's it's. It's one where you always think that you're you're feeling like hurt and you're having a stomach ache. See, I can't even remember the name. Because hypochondriac. <laughs> something like that. Yes, exactly. Like, like a hypochondriac, but there's an actual like psychologist term that they use that I didn't know. And it was like, I felt like really not smart. So I think we have- Psychosomatic. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, Caleb. See, now you guys could be a dietitian better than I can. But I think that's the part of the issue is that we're not using language that's always understandable. And so really it's important to make sure that when we're not being clear, even if it slows our process down that we ask. And so, and if we're not having interpreters there, you know, those are definitely your rights to have and, and to be a part of and have IEPs translated into Spanish if you request it. So the last, one of the next things that we're talking about is independent educational evaluations. So what this is about is that, let's say your child had their assessment, their triennial assessment, and you got back all of the reports and you write it over and they did his academics with the Woodcock Johnson or the Brigance, and they did his speech and language with the different tasks that they used for that. And they did other assessments depending on whatever services your child needs. And you're in the IEP meeting and, and, and you're like, you know, there's something not right with that particular assessment. And you wanna get a second opinion. That is really what an independent educational evaluation is, is the second opinion. Huh? Okay. I'll let you share. Um, it's it's a it's a second opinion, and what's hard is that because we work with education experts who are experts in our field and, and do that, it can be hard when you go into there and you say I'm not agreeing with the evaluation results, and you say I want to have the chance for an independent educational evaluation. So what that means is you say, I don't agree with the results in the speech and language assessment that was just done or that was done within the last two years. And I would like for my child to be reassessed in speech and language. So you would submit that letter to the school who would then pass it over to my department. And then we would relook at those assessment reports and we would decide if we could say, this is a defensible assessment or we say, you know, it's a defensible assessment, but we can see where the parent might want a second opinion. And we either fund for you to do the independent educational evaluation, or we have to file for due process. And that looks really tricky and become very yucky because then it feels like I am, um, you know, using my lawyer powers as the district to, to do that. And it's really not, it's ed code, it says, I either, Ed Code says, I either have to agree to fund it or I have to be willing to say, I'm going to file and um, defend it. So that's really what it's about. Either I'm funding it because yes, we, we see that you want the second opinion and we, we're not able to defend it to the level that we would say that we could, or we say, no, we're going to file and defend our independent educational evaluation. So if you say, yes, we're going to file, um, that becomes this whole legal route and it becomes very yucky. And as I said, we it really damages our relationship. When we fund them, we then say, okay, here is our policy from our North Coastal um, um, Consortium. Here's the policy on IEEs. Here's your procedural safeguards, again, because you need to know your rights. And then we say, okay, 
we are agreeing to approve your IEE in the area of speech and language, like in the, in the case that we were talking about. And we give you a list of people who are in San Diego County that meet the, the credentialing process. But we also say you're able to find somebody else in San Diego County as long as they have appropriate credentials and we can verify that and they meet our cost cap in from NICSI. So we give you a list of approved ones that we, we have vetted. It does, but we also say that you can find somebody else, which we, we do all the time. And then once that IEE is conducted, then we come back and hold an IEP meeting and discuss that evaluation and say either it's changing what our thoughts are or it's not because it's, it's reaffirming what we have already discussed. Any questions, concerns about IEEs? And then Lynn wanted to tell you a story about, for her, about IEEs. So um, I actually had my first experience with a PWN as a parent. Um, when um, my son was in preschool, he's now um, a freshman in high school, but um, he was in preschool and the speech and language pathologist had assessed him and she determined that he was no longer eligible for speech and language services. And um, I wanted a second opinion because I felt that he still needed those services. And in fact, he's still getting those services, which kind of tells you that um, I, I went ahead and got um, an independent evaluation and I sent it to the district. I actually um, paid for it myself just because, I don't know, <laughs> I didn't want to, I, I don't know, because I work in a district myself, I guess I didn't want to take district funds. But anyway, they they considered my the evaluation that I sent in and they sent me a PWN um, stating that they would reinstate those services and that he would now be getting um, speech and language services again. So um, so that was my experience with the PWN. So PWNs are not always like uh, rejecting something. Um, in this case, they were saying that um, he could continue to receive the speech and language. And this was a different district. I don't know if I told you that. <laughs> so. so the last thing we're gonna talk about is stay put rights because that sometimes seems like one of these really funky things. And so what it means is, let's say we have said to you that we want your child or that we believe that your child would do best in, let's say, I'm trying to think of a stay put that we've been doing lately. I don't know, like if there's a placement. So in stay put, it's really about placement and, and services. And so that if you don't agree with it, you have what we call a stay put right to keep you protections while we work things out. But again, you have to act quickly because that is. So let me give you, I'll give you an example of one that I know of from preschool to, to elementary. Um, in the preschool transition, we had a student that um, the parents didn't agree, no longer qualified for special education, even though we had done a multitude of assessments and found that we had remedied all of the interventions um, at preschool that they could now go into a general education setting in kindergarten without any supports. Um, and the parent didn't quite agree. And so um, we had a lot of, of different negotiations and compromises and conversations about this child's right. And so they did start off the year in what we would have considered a stay put setting. So they were still receiving all of the minutes that they would have in preschool in a gen ed setting until the parents agreed to, um, to sign the IEP and release the DNQ. Now, I know that sound, there's a lot of other things that we did in, in between there, but it was the whole idea that you do have the right to stay put into the services or placement that we recommend um, until we work, we work it out and are able to resolve that concern. Thank you. And as Lynn says, DN, DNQ means you does not qualify. So again, remember what I said to you, it's that whole idea of understandable language. So if you don't have that understandable language, like I can just do like very quickly, like a DNQ, then you'll see why we have that, that opportunity. Thank you, Lynn, for correcting me. All right. So the last one is really about our dispute resolution options. And this is one that I think has so much promise that we have not worked enough with. 
And that's about what to do when you disagree with what's right for your child and what do you do? And oftentimes what we're finding is that parents don't, aren't familiar that they have a, a step between like advocates and, and lawyers and due process and filings that we actually have an alternative dispute resolution through NICSI, which is again, a way to use a mediator in an informal process to really just recognize that there's a dispute and what can we do to solve it. And I love this particular idea because I think that the more that we can do to, um, we don't always agree and that's okay, but the more that we can work together in informal processes without involving advocates and lawyers and things, it continues to help us have that good relationship and collaborate because once we break that collaboration and that good relationship, the trust that you have of us in that we're going to provide um, appropriate education it just continues to dissolve and disrupt if we don't continue to collaborate and have good relationships. And so then that oftentimes revol revolves it resolves in parents filing complaints with CDE, Office of Administration hearings, discrimination, it could all of these things. And these are very formal processes that have consequences that cost a lot of money that do that. And that parents have gotten to the point and families that they're saying, you know, we're just, we're not able to resolve that. And yet if we had done more informal resolutions at the beginning and continued to collaborate and figure out ways to continue with that trust building, then we wouldn't see so many of our compliance denials of apes and discrimination. And so those are definitely ways and avenues that we, that parents have as formal processes that cost money, but in the end, it, it still has the, the negative result of, even though it supports your child, it doesn't resolve and have you help you build relationships. And if you have a child that starts off at three years old and it's gonna be with us until they're 22, that's a long time to have a very broken relationship. So the more that we can do to collaborate and be um, together is helpful. So, Oh, thank you, Deb. Deb Wickman put our OUSD education acronym glossary in our chat. And that is for that understandable language. And then Maria, what you will look for at the very beginning, we explained how to find at the bottom, there is a black bar that shows the interpretation with the, with the little circle on there. Okay. And then also just remember that within dispute resolution, the other part of that, yes, it is more fiscally responsible, but it really is about, I think, helping teams to work collaboratively with, with, with families and families working collaboratively with, with teams because the more that we can be together and not apart, it makes it much better for our children. So let's say at the very end, you're, you're saying, you know, I'm just not agreeing with everyone and I don't want my child to participate in special education. Yes, you can revoke consent. And then what I do is I'm the district. So when it says the district, you just put Leonardis will respond with a prior written notice saying, yes, we will discontinue services. Um, of course, we would try to talk with you and see what we can do, what's going on and why that is happening. But of course, we have had opportunities where we have done that. Would you like to do discipline? Okay, so school discipline and placement procedures. So can my child be um, suspended or expelled? Um, so when a student has an IEP, it's important for us to look at the behavior and determine whether that behavior is um, due to their disability or whether um, you know it's a child who is, I don't know, being naughty. <laughs> So, um, so we need to look at it and see, is this because of their disability? And is there something that we need to be doing differently um, at the school site to help them? Is it something where we need to be assessing their, um, the function of their behavior and so forth? So when um, a child has an IEP, um, you do have certain rights as a parent and the student has certain rights. And um, we need to look at, we need to you know, if they're, if they're being suspended or expelled, um, you know, on a regular basis or, or more, you know, more than once or twice, then we really need to start looking at, if we haven't already, looking at whether there's something more that we need to be doing at the school site. And if this is 
in fact, um, due to their disability. Um, and if we determine that it is not due to their disability, then um, they can be suspended or expelled as, um, as like a general education student might. Like, so for example, a student who has an IEP for articulation and they just can't articulate um, the blend SL, <laughs> they can't, then, um, so they just have like a speech IEP. Then, and yet they are, you know, participating in gang activity or something. Well, that is probably not, you know, due to their disability, right? So in that case, maybe they might be expelled for, you know, brandishing a weapon or something. But if a student is um, getting, you know, upset and, and they're having a hard time with like flexibility and change in routines and so forth, and it has to do with maybe a disability such as autism, then maybe... Um, that is more due to their uh, disability. And then that's something where we need to be looking at how can we support them better? And, and um, we would not be expelling them for, for getting upset and um, you know, pushing over a, a table or something um, because they're, they're frustrated about a schedule change, for example. So, um, and I'm really bad at, at numbers, I hate to admit it, but I believe it's like 10, once it gets close to the 10 days, there needs to be a um, manifestation determination. So there's a limit to the number of days that a student can be suspended um, if they have an IEP um, and it needs to be determined at that point, the manifestation determination, it needs to be um, determined whether the behavior is a manifestation of their disability. And that's where that fancy term manifestation determination comes from. One of the wonderful things about working in this team is that Lynn Dudas has a BCBA, which is, a, is one of her titles that means that she works on behavior and she runs our behavior team and has a behavior classroom. And as parents, if you need support with behaviors and those things can be like, if you have a student um, that uses a lot of visuals or visual schedules or needs help with some social stories, Lynn is an excellent resource for any of those things that you might um, need with that. And she'll drop her link to her behavior um, stuff in, in the chat. And you are welcome to reach out to her at any time for any of those um, things that she can able to do in English and Spanish. So again, as Lynn said, what happens after 10 days, then after 10 days, we have to hold what we call a manifestation of that student's um, manifestation of their disability. So when we look at that, what we're looking to say is, did were they being naughty or was this incident or was this thing as a result of their disability? So if you're looking at, let's say a student that is really impacted by autism, is not always able to communicate what's going on in their head, they need a lot of prompting, they need a lot of visuals, they use an AAC device. So we know that communication is a, is, is a hardship and they get really frustrated and instead of communicating or using their devices or their prompts, they start hitting. So in that case, as a school principal, I'm gonna say, okay, this child is hitting because they're frustrated because of their lack of communication. So in my mind, their hitting is a manifestation of their disability. As such, I have to make sure though that in their IEP that we have a behavioral goal that addresses that particular function of their behavior. So their, their communication, they're getting mad, they're getting frustrated. So we have to make sure that we have interventions in place. So we don't just do a manifestation and say, oh, that's your disability and we move on. We say, this is your disability. Now let's see what we can do as an intervention to support that child. It's not just like, it's okay and we're, we're gonna move on. It's no, we, we recognize that this, we're having this child, we're gonna continue to work on that. That also might mean though, as a school principal, when I work with you know, um, little smaller ones, that those, those behaviors might already still be addressed in their IEP, but we just wanna keep noting it up that this is um, a part of that. Um, so it's really in, important that when you think about that is that, um, is it a function of their behavior? And if it is, then we have one responsibility. And if it's not, we still, they are still under student services. And so what happens though is, is that because it's a part of it, a special education, 
still some of it is in student services. So if you said to me, I don't agree with this suspension, I would say, I'm really sorry to hear that, but you need to talk to Mandy Bell, who's the director of elementary because that's a student services and not necessarily an IEP if it wasn't a violate or wasn't determined to be a manifestation of their disability. It's a very tricky and complicated aspect and hopefully none of you will ever have to be a part of it because it makes you feel icky as a parent. It makes me feel icky as an administrator and as a teacher because, you know, like I got into this 25 years ago to help and work with children and now I'm working on naughtiness and that's, it just it feels icky. It's not always nice. So our key takeaways today is really is not telling you what goes in your IEP, but just the ground rules about how we interact with each other. And really, that is the key thing to take away is that you have the right and it's critical that you uh, um, participate in your child's education and that you have options, including due process, if you don't agree. And then so here are two ways that you can do this. TASK is a nonprofit that educates and empowers people with disabilities and their families. We sent the TASK flyer out last Monday through Blackboard. We also shared it with our case managers. Um, and if Lynn can find it in her email, she'll drop it in the chat for you here. And if she can't, um, feel free to, it's on our website. The alternate dispute resolution is, this is this number here. So this is an actual number to Nixie. Oops, I put it backwards. So 619-594-7383 is the phone number at the, NUSH, the North Coastal Consortium of Special Education. And that's a direct line to the person that is in charge of assisting parents when you don't agree with IEPs. And again, it's free, there is no cost. It's an informal way. You're, you know, I would love for more parents to use this and, and let this be known because I think that it's such a, a, a wonderful opportunity for parents to have that. Again, we, uh, my name is Leah Dardis, I'm the special education director, and we also have our special education website with our contacts. And this shows you who are the program coordinators within our district. So Ms. Cherie Benet works at our preschool and supports Del Rio and Libby, and also our, our non-public schools. Ms. Mrs. Beers is, works at our um, adult transition program and oversees our school psychologist team. Mrs. Burke oversees our base school. So that's all of our schools, Santa Margarita, North Terrace, Sur Mesa, and all of our middle schools, including our residential treatment centers. This lady, we, um, Lynn, has not updated our website here. She'll, she'll probably work on this today. And um, this is actually, her name is Tiffany Seeker, and she runs all of our other elementary schools. So by the end of today, this will be updated. So if you need to contact Tiffany Seeker for any of the elementary schools or spe speech language support, you can do that. And Erin Wade is our high school and Surfside person. And then if you wanna meet our wonderful Lynn Dudas, she's down here at the bottom. And again, she supports um, behavior moderate to severe and she works on um, any kind of behavior for our, our teachers. And I work on the uh, website, which I need to update, but um, but I included lots of parent resources on the website as well. So um, check it out. Where, where are they? They're under special education, parents as partner, parent there, parent guardians as partners. So here we are, we are just on our district website. So this is, this is a, a public facing uh, website. So you would go to our home page, click on departments, special education. And again, Lynn just told us to click on special education and parents as guardians. So in the PowerPoint, this is the last slide, you can click on the link where it's a special education website and it'll take you directly there. Um, the link is, or the PowerPoint is in the chat. I will also put it right here. So I will drop it right now, this particular page in the chat so that you can come to it back to it later. And this tells you again about that community advisory committee, our behavior resources, upcoming events, and additional parent guardian resources. And those are all right here that you can click on to do that. So if I click on behavior resources, you all heard it, look, it's there. So here are those behavior resources. So our positive behavior support, love and logic, um, free online training, videos in Spanish, 
and of color, of course, other video, other resources in Spanish too. So, um, the community advisory committee that takes us to um, Nixi. So, where I was telling you about, if you're having trouble with the wanting more or more about how to be part of our community, that's the community advisory committee. And then again, that resolving disagreements, that RSS process is right here. And that was exactly the number that I showed you about how to get help if you don't just agree with your IEP team. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and stop recording.